All right, my editing skills are crap, but can the same thing be said about Star Wars The Last Jedi? Stick around and find out. You guys excited? I wasn't, especially. I'm not uh, especially a Star Wars fan. I'll get to that in a second. Hi, I'm Peter Franson from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions, here with my uncut review of Star Wars The Last Jedi, which on the uh, IMDb synopsis uh, reads, Rey develops her newly discovered abilities with the guidance of Luke Skywalker, who is unsettled by the strength of her powers. Meanwhile, the Resistance prepares to do battle with the First Order. Um, okay, so I'm just going to say this right now. I'm not making two videos or wasting time talking about vague plot references. You know, no one's going to decide whether or not they want to see this movie based on my review. So I'm going full on spoilers here. Do not watch this review if you have not seen the movie yet and want to avoid spoilers. There are some big things to be spoiled in this movie. I'm going to spoil a lot of them. Turn back now. This is your last warning. All right, here we go. Um, first off, my preferences in movies. I prefer movies that are character-driven, that are uh, psychologically consistent-ish. <laughs> I know that's very relative and vague. Um, that have kind of a pseudo-realism to characters and the choices they make and stuff. Um, as, as I guess maybe a, a popular, quick, easy benchmark, I tend to not enjoy the Marvel movies that because the lightness in the, in the character presentation there tends to... Uh, Kind of take away from the some of the psychological realism and some of the consistency in the characters and who they who they are. Um, so I, I do tend to enjoy things that are more serious. Uh, although I do um, like what I would call character respecting humor now and then. If it if it flows out of who the character is, uh, then then you know some of that can be welcome as long as it's not too frequent. I just tend to not laugh at what you know other people think is funny. So um, I don't have any particular likes or dislikes a dislike of the of the Star Wars kind of franchise. I mean, I grew up with it and I enjoyed it and I certainly appreciate its creative legacy and, you know, how much we have, you know, George Lucas and the Star Wars trilogy, the original, to thank for all the crazy cool ideas that have found their way into other kinds of science fiction and all across media and stuff like that and, and different entertainment mediums. Um, so, I mean, I, I definitely appreciate it for that, but would do I prefer Star Wars as an intellectual property over, say, Battlestar Galactica or The Walking Dead or Farscape or Star Trek? No. To me, these days, it's just another one of these choices of intellectual properties. It is not like I'm not, I don't have really nostalgia for it. Um, I've got some nice memories of it, but I think that's different than nostalgia. So anyway, just wanted to give you a sense of kind of where I'm coming from. I, I think that where I'm coming from is definitely not kind of where the majority of people are going to be coming from. So you can just take my opinions for whatever you will, as I, as I think should always be the case. Uh, okay, so let me talk about my reactions, my thoughts and feelings about this one. This was enjoyable in a number of ways, but also an unusual experience. And I would say that's all in, in the realm of the script, you know, the, the things that I found unusual. Um, numerous times I felt like they were rehashing beats from the trilogy, which I'll get to that, some examples of that, um, which was a little unusual. It felt half like homage and half like I don't know, what are you doing? <laughs> Can we move on? Can we tell new stories and explore new ideas and new plot beats? And, you know, can we just do some new stuff? Go in a daring new direction. Um, so I wish that we would have seen more of that. Uh, there were numerous times that I felt robbed of payoff that I felt like they were kind of maybe building to, or maybe that I just brought to the theater that I personally wanted. Um, or I uh, felt sometimes confused by what seemed like plot inconsistencies or logical inconsistencies in the story. So let me break these down. I'll talk about inconsistencies first, then stolen payoffs, and then uh, some... Do I get to that later on? Oh, I'll talk about the characters a little bit, and then like repeated story beats toward the end of my uh, comments on the story. I, this is going to be a longer uh, kind of review probably than my, my normal length reviews. So... Uh, let's see here. Oh yeah, inconsistencies. Well first, some of this, some people aren't going to call these inconsistencies, they're just kind of like concessions that you make for movies that are made for families. Okay, the, the example I'll give, BB-8. This little android should be mass-produced, because if he is, 
the rebellion or the resistance or whatever they are now, <laughs> they can just say, hey, BB-8s, go and win this war for us. This little droid is so freaking capable. He can do anything, like anything. You, you give him a task, he will succeed. You know, uh, <laughs> I don't even know what more to say about BB-8. Mass produce him, he'll win the war for you. Uh, light speed technology should have been leveraged as a weapon long before now. I don't understand. It's It was a cool moment in this movie where, uh, what's her face, um, Jerpel, I'll, t I'll talk about her name, the uh, the purple general, which I call Jerpel, uh, sacrifices herself and you know sets a course for light speed to go boom right through the big dreadnought or whatever, whatever the big ship was surrounded by the smaller but still large ships. Like in one suicide stroke, uh, of just activating light speed in the right direct, pointed in the right direction. Boom! Takes them all out. She just takes them all out. And I'm thinking to myself, well, that was cool in terms of like kind of a, a, a moment. Like, whoa, you know, we never saw that before. But then I'm thinking, well, they had to know that the, potentially the technology could be used that way. Why have we not seen that move done before? Um, so anyway, that was cool in the moment, but a second later I was like, ah... <laughs> I got some problems with that. Um, and uh, let's see here. And the destruction of the Jedi books by both Luke and Yoda. Uh, that both characters seemingly affirming the end of the Jedi Order and the end of these books being around. But the books, I think, you tell me if you saw the same thing, they seem to survive. Finn opens up a drawer near the end of the movie to get something out or whatever, and the books all seem to be in there perfectly preserved, these last Jedi texts or whatever, you know. Um, and also Luke said that Rey will be the last Jedi after him. And I'm like, well, I thought we were okay now with the Jedis going away. I thought that's the whole conversation you and Yoda had while you were burning the books. <laughs> so it was just kind of like a little unusual. Now, these kinds of inconsistencies and the other kinds of criticisms I'm talking about, I want to recognize as there's some kind of a leaf blower as usual around this time of day as I'm recording my review going on right outside my window. Um, the, uh, these kinds of inconsistencies are going to be ignored, and I have no problem with them being ignored by people who enjoy other elements of the story. You know, there's there's franchises that I love that you know you could you know nitpick as I am kind of doing here and point out inconsistencies, and I'll defend them and I'll say, oh yeah, da 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 da, you got to think about it this way, da da da, and, and I'll rationalize it. And I think that's kind of what we tend to do much more readily with franchises, with fiction, with entertainment that is in some other is in some other other area really working for us, really working well. And, uh, you know, you can look at the same movie and there can be like legitimate problems that somebody has and other, another person actually has legitimate explanations and neither person is going to understand where the other is coming from. And I think, I, this is my theory, I think that it comes back to, okay, well, what is working in the movie or the fiction or the entertainment for you and how well is it working? That's going to make those other issues maybe not even noticeable or easily explainable in your mind. So anyway, uh, I apologize if it seems like I'm nitpicking, but uh, th it's because it's not in general the kind of story that I really connect with that I think a lot of these things kind of popped out to me. I, with each one of these, yeah, I could come up with something. Uh, just give me a minute. I could come up with some kind of explanation, but my mind doesn't go there because uh, the other things that aren't connecting with me don't lead me to give the movie the benefit of the doubt and kind of work for it. I remember, um, this is getting off track a little bit <laughs> if I haven't gotten off track already, but years ago I had a friend in college who loved Star Wars so much and would see like the little mat squares go following the TIE fighters as they were flying around and she said that she and her friends just decided that those were the deflector shields, you know, but it was an imperfection in the special effects. It wasn't deflector shields, you know, but I mean that's kind of where, and that's that's kind of an extreme example. She even laughed at herself, you know, for, for uh, you know, kind of, you know, that that way of thinking um, but that that is kind of the you know the, the direction that we tend to go so anyway um, don't take this as me saying this is a bad movie and that you're dumb for enjoying it if you didn't notice these things or have a problem with these things or whatever again just sharing my reactions here I know I'm going into maybe some uh, contested waters with the people really really loving uh, the Star Wars franchise a lot so it's not my intention to poop on anybody's parade <laughs> that's a great visual isn't it um, let's see here okay so that's it for inconsistencies now stolen payoffs these are possibly even more subjective because I think uh, they're affected by 
in, in some cases, certainly, things that I brought to the theater with me that I kind of would have liked to have seen. Um, so I do appreciate, I should say, that these, what I, I'm calling stolen payoffs, um, I appreciate that they were unexpected, that they went in directions that I thought the movie was going, the story was going in one direction to, to a certain kind of moment, and then, oh, they're not doing that, that moment. They're, they're doing a different thing. They're going down a different path. So I do appreciate that. I do appreciate how the movie kind of kept me like, huh, oh, Oh, they're not doing... Oh, huh. Um, at the same time, I would love to have those kinds of surprises and unexpected directions, but have them uh, hit me with dramatic weight rather than feeling more like a rug being pulled out from under me, which was the case for me with these, what I'm calling, stolen payoffs. So, the first stolen payoff. Ray and Kylo both saw each other turn, kind of in their force visions or whatever, but only one of them does. Um, Kylo turns... Well, he doesn't really turn. I, I guess in the end, neither one of them really turns. They both see in their visions, you know, the other turning. I think that could still happen. I'll come back to that thought. But we, it's just hinted at. And a lot of this, you know, these kinds of movies, this is, they're, they're serialized. And so we're looking at like a middle chapter of a much larger story. And so, you know, we have to keep that in mind as well. At the same time, I haven't seen that third chapter yet, uh, you know, of this little, of this particular trilogy. All I have to go on is what they've given me so far. So... Yeah, I'm just judging it on its own merits and how it, by itself, uh, ha affected me. Um, let's see here. Uh, well, it by itself, along with the, the previous history of Star Wars, blah, 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 blah. All right, let's see. Um, build up. Okay, build up to Kylo turning on his master. You know, we could kind of see that coming little by little, and then it ramped up toward the very end. We could see that, that he was about to turn on his master, which he does... But then he just stays on the dark side. I thought, oh, this is going to be a big moment, a big turning point. The, the character's going to go in a totally different direction. We're going to start seeing him changing and shifting and stuff. And eventually, at the end of this trilogy, he's going to be a totally different person, you know? Um, they, they didn't go there. Uh, so anyway, Snoke is built up as this mysterious master of the dark side. Who is this guy in The, in, um, the Force Awakens? And how does he know all this stuff about the Force? I thought all the Sith were wiped out. Or, you know, who, what is this, this myster who is this mysterious figure? Where did he come from? Where did he learn what he knows about the Force? All that kind of stuff. I mean, tell me you weren't asking that question. Maybe you weren't. But it's been my impression that, like, that's a hot topic. Everyone wants to know who the crap is this mysterious figure, Snoke. And then he's killed... <laughs> without exploring his origins, answering really any questions about where he comes from, how he got his knowledge of the Force. Um, really an unusual choice to, to kill him without explaining anything. Again, maybe they'll explain more of that in the third movie, but we don't have that third movie. Just looking at this one right now, that felt really weird. Um, okay, Jerpel, uh, the, the general with the purple hair who comes in to kind of replace Leia while she's in sickbay. Um... She, well, first off, the purple hair and just the way she was dressed, I was like, my first thought was pretty much reflected by Poe a moment later. I was like, she does not fit in with this crowd. She does not look like a general at all. She doesn't look like she's ready to bark orders and be serious and tactical and stuff. She came wearing her prom dress and she just had her hair dyed. Um, maybe she's, you know, I don't know what the deal is with purple hair. Maybe she's from a species of human that has purple hair. I don't know what's going on there, but... Even if there were reasons for it, just aesthetically, she stood out. She was, like, not visually like anybody else in the room and didn't seem to fit in with the role she was being given. Um, and so I, with Poe, was like, she is not what I expected. And then I expected, then, that because they acknowledged in the script that she's not what we expected, we'd learn more about her. Why is she different? Why did she come dressed like this? Or, you know, why... You know, just... I, I don't know. It just I just felt like visually the way they presented her... Um, I was just waiting for her to be explored, and she never was. I, I kind of think to myself now, well, why not have her replace Leia and have Le Leia self-sacrifice? Because as, as we know, Carrie Fisher passed away after filming her scenes for this movie, and so they've got to figure out what's, how they're going to handle that transition. I thought maybe this was it. Maybe they'd done some... some uh, they, they'd enlarged her character in, the resh in some reshoots at the end or something, and this was going to be kind of how they handled that, you know? Um, but that's not the way they went. She ended up sacrificing herself. I could have used another movie with Jerpel uh, to get to know her backstory and kind of the complexity of her character a little bit more. And it also would have potentially helped to transition in the wake of Carrie Fisher's death uh, if they had kept her around and had uh, Leia die in this movie. Um, so yeah, that was an unusual, just kind of like, here's this character, she's really unusual, and we're not going to explore her at all. 
Uh, yeah, that really unusual to me. Um, Luke, Luke pulls off an awesome force stunt in the climax, um, giving a sense of the power he's developed. At first, I was a little disappointed. I was like, oh, we're not going to get like this full-on lightsaber duel. And then there's the reveal that he's like projecting an illusion of himself from like, I don't know how far away in the other side of the galaxy. I'm like, holy crap, that was awesome. Luke is awesome. And so I thought, yeah. And then he says, see you around, kid. Um, and then he disappears, and then we see him floating and exerting effort, and then he sits down, or he floats, he lands, and I was like, dude, man, I can't wait for the third movie when we see him really go to town with a lightsaber. What the crap? Then <laughs> he starts having, like, this Jedi Force heart attack, and he dies. He just, you know, he vanished as the whole Jedi vanishing, his clothes fall down and stuff, and, and he goes the way of Obi-Wan Kenobi and Yoda and all that jazz. Um... So that was disappointing. <laughs> uh, now, you might be saying, you know, well, uh, in, in kind of a meta sense, Mark Hamill, you know, he's, uh, he's gotten up there in years. He's not, like, kept himself in kind of, like, action hero actor shape all these years. And so what, what, what were you expecting, Pater? Well, I, I was expecting that they would go more the wizard route, where he wasn't going to be the knight, you know, f you know, flying and flipping around and stuff. Even though they did some cool stuff, you know, that kind of went in that direction that was cool and satisfying in the end with him dodging Kylo's uh, lightsaber and stuff. Um, you know, I, I, and he seemed to have gotten himself in really pretty good shape for, uh, for that scene. He was looking pretty trim and ready for action, you know. But I did figure they're going to go a more wizard route where he's going to using, be using telekinesis more and stuff and, or some other kind of, well, in this case, the illusions and stuff like that. Um, I w thought it would have been really cool if he would have done like a telekinetic lightsaber duel where he just stands there just like with this, you know, kind of like zen whatever look on his face and he just like lets go of his lightsaber and it goes into the air and then it's like <laughs> doing all kinds of awesome fighting. He's just controlling it all with his mind. That would have been really cool. Uh, and I thought maybe we would still get that for a second in the third movie and then he has his Jedi Force heart attack, and he dies, so that's not gonna... As I think about it now, I'm wondering, gosh, Luke, would it have been easier to fly to the planet and do a telekinetic lightsaber duel instead of staying where you were and doing... to send the illusion out and give yourself a Force heart attack? Um, I don't know. I don't know how the Force works. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, and then the last one here. Ray's parents, or her parentage or whatever, is is revealed as being kind of just nobodies. You know, they weren't anybody special. She doesn't come from, like, the Skywalker line or anything like that. Uh, and uh, in one sense, that's cool because it kind of says, you know, even like a quote-unquote nobody like Ray can lead a significant life. I think that's a great truth um, that we are all made for highly significant lives, um, n regardless of where we come from, you know. Uh, and so I think that's a great, I think that's a great, you know, a little message there, but dramatically it fell short for me. Uh, and I still can't help but wonder if there's going to be a further truth that's revealed in the next episode. I mean, you know, she only had that moment of like, yes, my parents were just, you know, they weren't anybody special when she was talking to Kylo and Kylo could have been deceiving her or he and her could have both been wrong about it. She's not been to a grave site. We don't, we haven't seen corpses, you know, <laughs> so I would not be at all surprised if there's more to be revealed about her parents and where she comes from. And they might backtrack on this whole, like, she comes from, you know, nobodies, uh, nobody scavengers or whatever. I think there's probably more there, but I could be wrong. Anyway, so, yeah, a, lo a lot of the kind of, like, the, the issues that I have with the story and kind of things that were unsatisfying to me, they can... They could still be resolved and fixed in the third movie, but right now I don't have that one, so I'm not giving it the benefit of the doubt. I'm just looking at this thing here. And, um, and I mean, even... Even if they were to get resolved in the third one, I'm not sure that that would make this second movie a, in this particular trilogy a better experience for me. I really would have liked some more of these kind of impactful, satisfying moments to have, to have happened in this movie instead of what felt like them pulling the rug out from under me and just saying, hold off, or no, you don't get that, you know. Um, so talking just briefly about some of the main characters here, Luke... Um, well, he really uh, interested me in terms of his reasons for abandon abandoning the Jedi Order, and uh, and I appreciated his recognition of the hypocrisy and hubris of the Jedi Order uh, in and the the events of the, uh, the how they treated you know the their 
how they how they acted in the the prequels. Um, Mark Hamill also really had me on the edge of my seat watching his subtle and realistic feeling to me performance. You know, I've all I know is his stuff from you know the uh, the original trilogy, which is like you know by today's standards, you, actors and what they had actors do, the type of performances they had actors you know coaching actors to do and asking them to do, it just wasn't of the same level as as today, where much more often in movies you have actors that are being required to do very subtle things, very subtle, like just a subtle welling up of tears in their eyes and stuff. You just didn't see a lot of that by comparison in movies of like the 70s and 80s, certainly not movies anyway that were like geek genre movies, you know. So, um, so and then, you know, since then, he's I've just known him mostly for his voice acting and uh, playing these kind of more bombastic characters. He's done some TV spots and stuff over the years where he plays these kind of like over-the-top characters. So I was like, I don't know if he's going to be able to, is he going to stick out like a sore thumb with all these other kinds of mo modern actors? But no, he really delivered what was for me a, a really nice, subtle, grounded performance. I'm going to probably use the word grounded more times than you want to hear. Um, but I, I uh, yeah, I really liked it a lot. I, I hope he gets more serious character roles in the future, in the near future as a result of his work in this movie. Um, this is the best dramatic acting I've ever seen from him. So I really, really enjoyed Mark Hamill in this movie. Um, Leia uh, also had some nice moments. Although Carrie Fisher's voice and speech have changed so much over the years, possibly due to heavy smoking, I think that's something that she's kind of just been doing, you know, had been doing for years and years. I don't know if that's what I'm hearing or not. Uh, probably in the depth of her voice, but also just in the way she shapes her vowels and the way she talks, there was some just some just some different things going on there. Uh, so to the point that I I, I found it to be a distraction, both in the, For uh, the Force Awakens and in this movie. Unlike Mark Hamill and Harrison Ford, she is almost unrecognizable to me when compared to the Carrie Fisher of the 70s and 80s. Um, still, I adjusted somewhat and felt like her performance was more grounded and realistic than in the last movie. Um, Leia had also a great moment early on in this movie when she survived being blown into space, which I was like, there they go. This is how we're going to see her off, you know. But she survived that, and it was a really cool moment to see where we see her inherited force powers on display, you know, in ways that we, of course, never had before, and uh, and it was surprisingly moving to me. Um, it was a it was one of my favorite scenes in the movie, so that that was a cool moment. Um, other than that, you know, um, uh, Carrie Fisher's performance was not like a standout to me. Um, Kylo Ren, um, still a complex and layered character, as far as I'm concerned, but almost all of that seems to come from Adam Driver's fantastic performance. I really wanted to know more about why he so naturally gravitated toward the dark side as we learned that he did earlier in life. Um, was that just pure force genetics passed down from his grandfather Darth Vader or does something in his history play a part? Uh, I was bummed that he just kind of took Snoke's place after killing him, which I mentioned before. Uh, he talked just, you know, prior to that, well, I think about act actually after killing Snoke, he talked about letting old things die and then invited Rey to join him. And for a second, I thought he would introduce a third option away from siding with either the Order or the Rebellion. I was like, wow, what is he about to suggest here? That they, the, the two of them just kind of go off, you know, and, and just abandon this whole conflict? And, and just, I was like, what could this third option be? But nope, it was same old duality. Join me, we will rule the galaxy together as boyfriend and girlfriend. <laughs> so I guess that's what he was uh, offering there. And Ray did not take him up on it. Uh, I really enjoyed Daisy Ridley's performance uh, as Ray again in this movie, but I wanted something more than just her growing beyond her insecurities. I feel like that coming of age motif that uh, that we, we've seen before in, in both in this franchise and in all kinds of fiction, I, I wanted something a little bit different from her just kind of coming of age metaphorically, you know. There were indications that she was quick to explore the dark side that was something that really concerned Luke in this movie. Um, and her uh, parentage isn't a closed case as far as I'm concerned. So I wanted more of her backstory and more of these elements to, uh, to be explored, to, uh, to change, to have reveals that would change the direction of her arc going forward. But as it is, it still just feels very safe to me. What was her kind of big moment, I feel like, near the end was like, I'm going to learn to move these rocks. I'm going to, you know, grow in my ability to use the force and stuff. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm trying to figure out what exactly her 
big character moment was, her arc. I mean, I guess she was, you know, maybe exploring just a little bit of temptation of the dark side, but it didn't feel enough to really, like, be, like, a major moment in the arc of her character and where she's going. Um, I would love, personally, to see her go dark and to never be redeemed. Um, this is suggested by a fan... Uh, a, uh, a fan theory out there that um, that Ray would go dark and Kylo Ren would go light, and they would end you know the the franchise in those states. And uh, I actually would have loved that for Ray to go dark to become a cautionary tale, even to the very end, never being redeemed, um, and for uh, for Kylo Ren to become a story of you know uh, uh, redemption or repentance, maybe is is probably a much better word. Um, Anyway, uh, moving on. Finn and Poe. I'll just talk about these guys briefly together. John Boyega and uh, Oscar Isaac. Both, I think, do great with these characters, but I, I think of them, one of them anyway, as being one character too many. I'm not sure exactly which one. If I could choose, I would probably ditch Finn from the get-go, not have him in Force Awakens or this one, and develop Poe a lot more, and then save that Finn story concept of a stormtrooper leaving the order it's a great concept save that for its own dedicated movie spin-off uh, and give more time for poe to be explored in uh, both of these movies um, i don't have any comments on the rest of the cast aside from saying that i thought they nearly all elevated the material that they were given uh, to work with uh, solid solid performers pretty much across the board i think i think this movie could have been about 10 minutes or more shorter than it was uh one sequence in particular, I'm just like, ugh, why is this in here? It's for, well, I'll tell you why it's in here. It's for people other than me, you know? Uh, we've got Finn and the tech lady whose sister died at the beginning. She's kind of mourning that. She decides to help out Finn, and they're looking for this ultimate coder. That's going to help them get away from the Empire. Uh, and so they have to go down to this planet and find this ultimate coder and explore this, you know, kind of like arms dealer society and da da da. I'm just like, why not just supply that coder from within the resistance and then let him still be a traitor at some point? You can still accomplish, I think, what they did in terms of the, the story down there. I mean, maybe there was a little bit of character development, but again, with with a story that I already feel like is, you know, spreading characters too thin... Uh, I, I would have preferred to cut it out and spend that time in a different way. Um, all that running around on the arms dealer planet, it, what it felt like to me was just kind of a lighthearted romp for the kids, you know? It even had kids in there that I think probably kids in the audience are meant to kind of, you know, connect with and relate to, you know? Uh, for my taste, that whole sequence on that planet could have easily been written out. Um, there's also, as I mentioned uh, earlier, a lot of repeated story beats uh, again. Uh, there was that was a big complaint among many of of the Force Awakens that it seemed to just kind of take the same plot skeleton from A New Hope episode four and just kind of rehash it here. And uh, I feel like some of the same stuff was done this time around, but this time taken from from what I could see from the trilogy uh, as a whole instead of just from say Empire Strikes Back. Um, so we had like uh, Snoke. Uh, showing, you know, Rey that her friends were losing in a space battle and showing her that from the throne room, just like the Emperor showed Luke that his friends were losing a space battle from his throne room. Um, and let's see here. Oh, we have uh, Luke uh, being struck down and then joining the Force, although kind of with a small twist from the original, which was Obi-Wan being simply struck down and, and then joining the Force. Uh, we have the, uh, the Rebel base being attacked... Uh, the rebel base with a giant metal door being attacked by giant walkers and then, you know, being defended against by, you know, flying tactical fighters, you know. Uh, and then in this one, we've got the resistance base with a giant metal door being attacked by giant walkers and, you know, fought against by, you know, smaller ships from the from the resistance. Let's see, we've got the Luke parentage being revealed in Empire Strikes Back. That was a big moment. And in this one, we have the Rey parentage kind of being revealed as being, oh, it's not as exciting as you thought it was <laughs> gonna be uh then we've got the darth vader turning on and killing the emperor in the uh, return of the jedi and in this one it's kylo ren turning on and killing uh snoke leader snoke <laughs> uh so really the list i think goes on and on others on the internet will no doubt treat it much more exhaustively but uh, i was just kind of like why are we doing this? Why can't we just go in some bold, bold new directions? So as I said, I think in my last review uh, of the start, well, no, it was either my review of The Force Awakens or my review of Rogue One. I can't remember which one. But I'm excited for when this trilogy is done, for when they have 
given done fan service to all of the original aging actors who they've brought back and stuff. Let's kill them off and get them out of the way or whatever we got to do. Let's fast forward the, the, the plot 300 years into the future. Let's just be, you know, maybe if you want, I guess you can still deal with the Skywalker bloodline, but I don't even care about that necessarily. Let's just tell daring new stories with new arc, kinds of arcs, and there's so much stuff you can do in this world. Um, anyway, uh, I would have loved a big reveal like Empire, oddly enough, as much as I'm saying I don't, you know, I like new things instead of, you know, these old beats kind of redone, I would have loved a big reveal like in The Empire Strikes Back that was shocking and dramatically changed how we view one or more characters in this trilogy. Um, as I said before, one fan theory suggested that Kylo Ren would turn to the light side and Rey would turn to the dark side. That could still happen, I think, in the third movie, and it was arguably hinted at even in this movie, but I wanted that now so that we could have a whole movie dealing with the repercussions of that next time. Uh, as it is, you know, I'll be lucky if I even get that in the third movie. All that said, spending a lot of time on these kind of nitpicky things, I do love this world. Um, I don't really enjoy the stories written for it in the movies anymore, but the world still stands strong to me. All the crazy creatures you get to see, all the cool vehicles and spacecrafts and stuff like that, all the kind of the, the, the world they've created, the, the, the New Order and all their, you know, their culture and the, 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 re, the resistance and, and uh, of course, the Jedi stuff, the lightsabers, the Force, all that kind of stuff. There's just so much to explore and to, uh, and to spend time playing around with in this world. The world still really stand strong for me uh, and I feel like they represented you know the best of what the, the Star Wars world as a setting has to uh, to offer here um, and then also there was lighting and subtle visual touches and how the movie was made that made this world feel as grounded to me as ever so I really appreciate that uh, even when the script got a little silly for my taste the more serious visual style helped me to get past those silly moments and back into an investment in the story so that was really greatly appreciated um, as far as, I've already talked about the cast, as far as like stunts and visuals, I'll just say briefly that there were some surprisingly obvious green screen moments a few times to, to my eye. Uh, but otherwise, solid effects with plenty of practical stuff, pl practical effects to keep it from becoming a cartoon for me for too long. Um, it still has that great grounded look that the last movie gave us for the most part. So yeah, that was, that was really great. Really appreciated that. John Williams is back at it again doing the score. His score is as melodramatic as ever. You know, it wouldn't feel like Star Wars without that musical style. You know, I have to, I have to admit that. But I might enjoy it more if it were more modern sounding. Again, I am ready for them to just take this franchise in a totally different direction stylistically. Keep the world, but, you know, ditch... You know, now that I think about it, have they ditched... Did they ditch the wipes? Anybody know? Mention in the comics. Did they... In the comments, did they do a wipe? Did they do a circular wipe or whatever? I don't know if I saw a single wipe in this movie. I could be wrong. But uh, anyway, those kinds of little things. And I would add to that the score and the style of the score. Uh, I'm ready to be done with. You know, let's te you know let's use a different type of a more modern type of score, and uh, that would really tickle my fancy quite a bit. All right. Um, well, as I uh, as I always try to do, I, you know, I'm asking myself: Is there anything of worthwhile moral, philosophical, or spiritual significance going on in this movie that uh, might stimulate worthwhile thought or conversation? And the uh, Star Wars movies are often good for that. Um, they usually aren't like a model of uh, good thinking, good philosophical thinking. You know, but they they often do have some nuggets and stuff that you can easily kind of look at, turn over, and consider. Um, I, I appreciate, as I mentioned earlier, Luke's criticism of the hypocrisy of the Jedi religion. Um, I wonder if George Lucas himself recognized the hypocrisy in some of what he had the Jedi's preaching in the prequel movies. But... Um, it also, you know, that, that recognition of the hypocrisy among the Jedi Order who represent the light side of the Force, or do they? Do they just represent a balance? I don't know. That kind of got a little bit wonky. They were super into balance, you know, not necessarily into light. So is there? Cool, dude, that would be a cool option if the Jedis represent balance. You know, like, we're just going for balance here, you know? Don't love, don't love. That's too much light or something, or that leads to hate or darkness or... Ever the crap. <laughs> so you got the dark side, and then with the Sith representing that, you got the balance, which the Jedi represent. Wouldn't that be cool if there was a third element? It's like, no, we're going to represent light. We're going to represent good. We're going to be all about good. Um, that would be interesting. But anyway, as, as it is now, we're kind of robbed of seeing the Force uh, in terms of pure good and pure evil if the Jedi are representing the light side of the Force because they are 
obviously hypocritical and stuff like that. So without an objective, pure source of goodness, um, I have to ask where is the objective morality coming from that our heroes presumably claim to base their actions on? You know, they are the good guys. They are fighting for a good cause. Well, really, what makes that? What makes their cause good? What objective reality, uh, other than their selfish desire for, for freedom and survival, you know, um, is good? You know, what, 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 is, what are they basing? Uh, I know I, that sentence was all wrong. Anyway, uncut reviews. <laughs> And <laughs> keep forging onward. Um, so, yeah, where is the objective morality coming from that our heroes presumably claim to base their actions on? Um, and the truth is, I think, that you won't find objective morality in a philosophical system like the one presented in Star Wars and its concept of the Force. Uh, ironically, the logical conclusion of that philosophy uh, is uh, represented by the jaded and morally detached traitor character, the coder in this movie, who told Finn after betraying him, Hey, you know, essentially he says, today the order blows you up, tomorrow you, tomorrow you blow them up. And that was pretty much it. You know, it's just like, that's just, that's just life, that's just how it is. I'm just doing what I gotta do in the meantime. You know, without a source of objective morality to argue from, it's really just a matter of seeing who shouts louder or has the better weapon. Um, which is, sounds a lot like the internet, doesn't it? <laughs> um, my hope, though, is that audiences will listen to that coder's observation and at the same time consider Luke's criticism of the Jedi Order and their philosophy and recognize the need for something that is not a balance or this mix of light and darkness. Why in the world would we want to, the status quo to be a mix of bad and good? Why would we not want the status quo to eliminate evil? and have only good. Um, why would we not want some, something or someone, rather, who is, who is themselves objective, pure, and perfect good and love? Um, so anyway, those are my thoughts. Uh, if I have no idea what your taste are in movies, probably very different from mine when it comes to Star Wars, but if I were a time traveler, I'd go back in time and say, Psh! hey, Pater, um, just wait and watch this one with your boys. They're probably really going to dig some of the parts that you don't like and vice versa. Uh, it's a nice halfway point experience for you to share with your boys. And even though it will be unsatisfying to you in many ways, it will still remind you that this world has some cool ideas floating all over the place that are begging to be explored. Um, maybe eventually in a kind of story that you can really enjoy. It's rated PG-13 for sequences of sci-fi action and violence. All right, those are my thoughts. I'd love to get yours in the comments below. Uh, please consider supporting this channel by becoming a Spirit Blade Insider, which grants you exclusive monthly behind-the-scenes content. Um, for more info, you can visit our About page over at spiritblade.com, where you'll also find our, our audio dramas and our weekly podcast. Um, finally, there's a ton more content and community for you to enjoy and take, uh, take part in over at christiangeekcentral.com. So I hope you'll join us there soon as we continue to geek out and seek the truth. Hey, just a reminder that this humble little YouTube channel is so dependent on uh, people just like you. There are three main ways you can support this channel, and they're all over at spiritblade.com. The first is to purchase one of our sci-fi or fantasy audio dramas. Second is to give us a donation of any amount. And third, you can become a Spirit Blade Insider and get access to exclusive behind-the-scenes monthly goodies. You can get more information on our About page over at spiritblade.com. Thanks so much.